Welcome to Major Keys. I'm here with Lindsay Gottlieb, the assistant coach from the Cleveland Cavaliers. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you for joining me, coach. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, excited to, to chat with you today. Thank you. All right, so let's just dive in. How did you find sports? How did you find basketball? Wow, going all the way back, um, I, I can't remember a time in my life without sports. I, I'd have to say sports found me more. Um, just from being a kid, I think I always gravitated towards a ball, towards you know games of any kind. Uh, I had I'm the youngest of four, so I had older siblings, um, uh, and, and my whole family was into sports. But I'd say particularly, I spent a lot of time following my brother around and and uh, playing in the backyard uh, with both my mom and my dad. Speaking of looking up to, to someone, who were your early role models? It doesn't have to be basketball, but who were those early role models for you? Well, I definitely remember. So my brother is eight years older than I am, and uh, he played high school baseball. And, and I remember, you know, walking to the high school every day when I was done with, I must have been in elementary school, right? And, and going to hang around his buddies and his friends. I think, you know, I really, really idolized him and them. Uh, and then as I got older and I, and I started to kind of get into coaching uh, or at least the mindset around coaching, then I started reading everything, you know, there was to read about, you know, your great coaches from, you know, Pat Summit to Tara Vanderveer to, uh, you know, every, every sport really, uh, you know, I, I followed everyone and everything I could when it, when it came to people I could learn from. I read that you were watching the NBA draft when you were young and you said, I want to be a GM in the league. What made you believe that that was even possible and what kind of, uh, I guess, during the draft inspired that? Well, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about that quite a bit this year, you know, on the journey sort of to the NBA and people asking, how'd you get there? The number one thing is that when I was a kid, nobody told me I couldn't. Like, it's just such an important thing. I think there was at one point when I was little, I wanted to be the shortstop for the New York Yankees. And then another point in my life, I wanted to be a U.S. Senator or a Supreme Court Justice. And... Um, you know, work in the NBA. And I didn't have, I never remember anyone saying, now that's not for you, right? That's only for boys or that's for somebody else. And so that mentality, I think that environment of, of believing you can do anything was fostered by my parents and, and my circle. And I'm so grateful for that. So growing up, like I was, I was definitely a sports nerd. Like I love playing, but I love watching and, and the, the mental part of putting together teams. And so uh, the idea of the draft was exciting to me. The idea of, you know, there was a job where, you know, someone's charged with putting a team together, you know, a GM. I thought that was so cool. So uh, I think when I, when I said I want to be a GM one day, there wasn't anyone telling me, no, you can't do that, which I realize now was not, not that common and something that I'm really grateful for that probably helped me along the way in my career, particularly as a, as a woman. So your career, it takes you to Brown. Uh, you have a couple of injuries that, you know, put you on the sideline, but obviously that, that push you toward coaching. Um, and you get the opportunity to be a player coach mm -hmm. while you're there. And upon the end of your career, or excuse me, your, yeah, your playing career, you send your resume to every D1 coach there is in the women's game. And you hear back from Syracuse, get an offer from Syracuse, but you also get a letter or a note back from Pat Summit and Tara Vanderveer, two coaching giants in our game, two legends in our game. What did that mean to you? Right. How, I mean, how cool is that? Uh, so it was actually during my senior year uh, at Brown that I was, I mean, I had a unique um, opportunity there. So I really appreciate, you know, my college coach, Jean Reber, allowing me to do that. So I was still playing on the team, but I was working in the office and, and it was winter break. And, you know, the only the athletes are there on campus. And I, and I felt like I wanted to kind of get a leg up on getting a, getting a job. I knew that's what I wanted to do next. So I wrote all these letters. So as the second semester started, I would go to my little post office box that you had in, in college back in the day. And I would, you know, I'd go and open it. And there were these like letters coming back as if I was a big time recruit, which of course I never was. Uh, you know, I got a few letters here and there, but not one from Pat Summit or Tara Vanderveer. So uh, you know, those two, you know, as you mentioned, wrote me handwritten notes. Uh, it was amazing. I mean, the thing I think, again, with perspective now, who they are in the profession and what they had done for them to take the time to, you know, encourage me and write me notes. It's all about uh, giving back. It's all about 
lifting other people up. It's all about uh, empowering the next generation of women to do great things. And that's something I take really seriously now. I mean, the more that I can, you know, I have to be good at what I'm doing. I have to focus on my, my job and be a good assistant coach for the Cavs every day. But in addition, if I can have a phone conversation with someone or speak to a group of young people, uh, I'm going to do that because that's, that's how I got, um, I think, uh, my start in this profession. I think that's how you use your platform to the best of your ability. Do you remember what those notes said? Yep. Uh, Tara's in particular said, um, so a lot of people sent form letters essentially saying, you know, we don't have a job right now. And Tara's had a handwritten note at the bottom and it said, uh, Lindsay, the women's game needs young people like you in it. You know, best of luck. Keep pursuing your goals. Let me know if I can ever help. Um, and it's so interesting. I think it was, so if I was 21 then, it was literally 10 years later. Uh, I was a head coach at UC Santa Barbara and we were playing Stanford uh, in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And obviously, you know, then when I returned to Cal as the head coach facing her on the other end of the, the sideline many times. I mean, it's very surreal even to think about that. So I remember that one in particular. And, and I just remember that Pat Summit, you know, wrote me back and had her name on it. She was such obviously an, an icon and a legend. I was just happy to get anything, uh, anything from her in the mail. You mentioned that first head coaching job. You get that job 30, 31, very successful at a very young age. Um, and then you go on to Cal and you have a very successful career there in the Pac-12. What did coaching 18 to 20, 22 year old women um, mean to you and what did it teach you? So while I was in college, um, you know, the, the sort of moment that I decided that I wanted to pursue uh, college coaching as my career, uh, it was really for two distinct reasons. The first one was, uh, I, you know, I was such an X's and O's nerd. And while I was playing college, I realized, wow, this is really a profession. Like, you know, you can do this, you can coach. But the other thing that really pulled me is that while I was that 18 to 22 year old, uh, you know, having conversations with my friends in collegiate athletics, I, I realized that people's experiences were all along the spectrum, right? Some people had great experiences and some of my friends were pretty miserable. And, and almost all of their experiences, I think, were directly tied to how they felt about their coach, how they felt about their team, about the sports experience they were having. It wasn't really about the class size in their chemistry class or what the dorm food was like. I mean, it was really about that, you know, very uh, intimate, intense athletic experience. And so I think when I was thinking about what I wanted to do in my career, I, I wanted to do something I was passionate about, which was basketball, but I also wanted to have an impact on people. And it just really hit me that, um, you know, 18 to 22 year old college athletes are very impressionable. It's when you're kind of figuring out who you are and what you're going to become. And so the opportunity to impact that age group was exactly why I got in the profession. And in my 20 years in coaching women's college basketball, it was the, it was the most rewarding thing. It was the toughest thing. It was the thing I took most, you know, seriously was how to empower, uh, you know, young women. And I think the impact that had on me and, and what I sort of did with that role, it, that evolved even over the course of my career as I got older, as I had different experiences, as the student athletes changed a little bit. So it was like the single most important thing, I think, in my uh, coaching career, particularly, you know, the aspect of it, of it in college. And then the opportunity to join the NBA and go to the Cavs comes along. And this was by no accident. You were working toward this goal, right? Um, what have you learned since making that jump? Yeah, I mean, I think I had a vision, right? I had a little bit of like a dream of, okay, you know, the NBA is out there. It, it wasn't like I was plotting or something. It wasn't a direct plan. And like you said, it just, it really did just kind of come along at that place in time. Uh, you know, there was a lot more talk about women in the NBA, obviously Becky Hammond, you know, coaching for the Spurs and some of, you know, Adam Silver's talk about getting more women involved was making it more realistic. But in that moment, you know, the Cavs sort of think, came after me, crafted this particular role and job for me. And it felt like, you know, the right thing to do at the, at the time. Um, but uh, a lot of things have come along with it. Uh, number one, you know, I was definitely scared, right? Uh, I was, it was very comfortable at Cal. I loved what I was doing. Um, I wasn't looking to go anywhere, but I think that's sometimes where our greatest moves come, right? When it's a challenge, uh, when it's hard to leave somewhere else, you, you might even know you're doing the right thing by feeling compelled and pulled to do something different. So it's been unbelievable. Uh, I don't think this year, 
went as anyone would have scripted. I mean, we had a, we had a coaching change at the all-star break. That was kind of wild. Um, obviously, you know, the, the COVID-19 shutting the season down, I think temporarily, you know, if we get back, nothing was sort of by the script, but I've learned a ton. Uh, it's been unbelievable. Um, I feel really at home here. I feel like uh, I'm contributing and adding value to the organization and I feel like everyone's really embraced me. So uh, it, it's been an unbelievable life experience and professional experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, any specifics you want to know about, I'm happy to answer, but just overall, it's been such a big change, but, and hard, but really rewarding and fulfilling and, and pretty incredible. Have you felt like you've been uniquely positioned in any way, um, in any situation that you've encountered this year since joining the staff? that you were uniquely positioned for because you were either um, in the women's game or that you as a woman were uniquely positioned to, to handle? Yeah, I mean, I've coached basketball for 20 years, right? It's not like I'm coming in here as a rookie coach. It's, I'm, it's my first year in the NBA, um, but, but I think I've been treated and sort of respected as if I've been coaching for a long time. So in terms of uniquely positioned, I mean, I can tell you a story of when I probably felt the most comfortable and, and that was when, you know, I delivered my first scouting report, right? Because there's a lot of things that are different. Um, there's a lot of new relationships to be built. Obviously, the guys were super accepting right away and as well as the staff in the front office. But in that moment of, you know, sitting there with the team and delivering my first scouting report, I think I felt the most at home because that's what I've done, you know, probably 5,000 times, right, over my, over my coaching career, maybe more, given a scouting report, talked basketball. So in that moment, I felt like, yeah, everything I've done up to this point has, has led me to, to be ready for this. Um, and in addition, I would say, um, you know, I think that uh, what, what high-level athletes value the most about their coaches transcends gender, right? They want to know, do you know your stuff? They want to know, can you make me better? They want to know, uh, you know, do you care about me as a human being? They, they don't care about, are you a male or female? And, and so that's why I think, you know, I was accepted, you know, right away. That being said, I do think there's some qualities I have, whether they're uniquely from my female perspective or my women's college basketball perspective. I do think, you know, I can add, I don't shy away from being different. I don't shy away from, you know, being exactly who I am, which is bringing a different perspective. So in that sense, I also think I've been uniquely set up here uh, to be valued for who I am. And so I bring a different voice and, and perspective to the table. Unlike some of maybe the other um, women that have been brought into the NBA um, during this influx, you, you mentioned that Adam Silver has spearheaded. Um, you are uniquely positioned because you were a head coach for so long coming in to the league and you had this vision, right? I read that you had in your contract at Cal that if the NBA came calling, that, that you would explore pursuing that. So you definitely had a vision. What else is in your, uh, I would say, maybe your master plan uh, <laughs> moving forward? Uh, so I promise I don't, I don't have, you know, this big master plan out there. Um, you know, the, 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 the clause in the contract, I, I did feel like, I mean, I think that was just a notion of like dreaming big, right? And, and, and every coach has like a buyout clause. And if you were to go to a competitor school, I get it, right? Like there's compensation to people do buyouts. I just, if the NBA was an option, I, I just didn't want there to be some type of financial hurdle in the way. So it was, I think part of just my long-term thinking of I don't want to take away any options for myself. And that's kind of how I am thinking right now too. I, every single day, I want to be a great assistant coach for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I want to help J.B. Bickerstaff, our head coach, be as successful as he can be. I want to help, you know, all the guys on, on our roster achieve their individual goals and for us to achieve our team goals. And really, that's what I think about every single day. Now, you know, I still, I hope, have a lot of career left. Um, and so I just believe that anything is possible. Uh, I'm really enjoying this. And, and I signed on here to be part of uh, getting this organization back to where we want to be, the playoffs, you know, super successful. And then if something else comes along in another part of my career, I hope that I'll be ready for that. Whether that's being, you know, a head coach again, we'll see. Um, whether that's, I don't know, someday down the road, you know, doing something different in management, whatever, we'll, we'll see it. But I think you set yourself up best for whatever else is next in, in your life by doing a really good job where you are, by being authentic, by, um, you know, working hard, serving other people, making great relationships, and then, um, you know, going, you know, where your, your heart and passion pull you at, at that point. But I'm telling you, I'm really happy to be here and to be part of what 
we're doing. Uh, and even during this pandemic, I think it particularly highlights that just because I'm so eager to get get back to it. You know, I miss it. I miss the team. I miss the guys. I miss, you know, the kind of momentum that we had been building. Visibility and representation are so important to young girls. What is your hope for women in the NBA? Maybe what that looks like in 10 years? You said it. I mean, people can't believe that they can be something until they see it, until it, it normalizes a little bit. So, you know, my hope for the NBA, which I think is just an unbelievably progressive league, a well-run league, I mean, we have terrific leadership, we have ter terrific, you know, players and people uh, in the league. My, my hope is that the, the league continues to uh, go after the best talent uh, that there is, uh, that organization by organization, they look and say, how can we be the best? And I think at some point you start to realize if you're not considering a diverse pool, then you're not as good as you can be, period. So in my mind, eventually that's going to include more and more women because you can't be at the top of your game without, um, you know, including everyone. Uh, you have to find the right people, uh, obviously, but, but I imagine that the NBA will continue to diversify when it comes to women. I think men's college basketball, uh, it's, you know, will eventually hire women because I can't believe, you know, people are looking at their staff and saying this is the best staff it could be without having a uh, diversity of, 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 of gender, of thought, of people. So I do think as we go forward, sport organizations will continue to mirror other successful companies, which are saying you gotta be more uh, diverse to be as successful as, as possible. Uh, and in the meantime, I, I hope that just being, you know, one of a handful of women in the NBA that, you know, there's tons of girls out there who may not have an interest in basketball per se, but I want them to see that if they have an interest in science or in business or, you know, engineering that in some way seeing women break barriers in other realms that they're also more empowered to uh, break down barriers in whatever it is that they're interested in specifically. All right, coach, I have two quick more fun questions. Uh, what is your favorite female sports moment of all time? Probably um, in person, I saw Martina Navratilova's last match. It was at Madison Square Garden. Uh, and I went with my mom and my sister and it was like a totally cool uh, moment to be at. Uh, so I would say uh, for me personally, that just really stands out. All right, and then my last question, which I ask of all my guests, is uh, for a major key of advice. So if you could tell young women, young girls, uh, one piece of advice, what would that be? I would say find that ability to be authentic as, and to be the real you and embrace that as early as you can. Uh, I think there's a, you know, young women and girls spend a lot of time trying to be something else, uh, trying to, you know, get out of their own skin. And then eventually you realize feeling comfortable in your own skin is, is the best thing you can do for yourself and also to help you be successful in whatever it is that you choose. So find your authentic self and then, and then rock that. Thank you so much, Coach. That's great advice. And I appreciate your time uh, during this craziness. Um, to, to talk and, and to share some some knowledge. So thank Thanks you so for much. Having me. It's been fun. I thought the whole thing was fun, not just the last two <laughs> questions. I thought all of it was fun. So thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> keys, keys, keys. I got the keys.